Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 700 Club. I'm Andrew Knox in for Gordon Robertson today. Israel continues to say no to a Palestinian state. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu argues it would give a huge reward to the unprecedented terrorism of the October 7th massacre. The Washington Post reports the U.S. and its Arab partners are pushing to complete a timeline for a two-state solution after the war is over. CBN's Julie Stahl explains why a Palestinian state remain, remains a non-starter for Israel. After a call with President Biden, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu again rejected the idea of recognizing a Palestinian state. Posting on X, formerly known as Twitter, he summed up his opposition in two sentences. Israel categorically rejects international dictates regarding a permanent settlement with the Palestinians. Such an arrangement will be reached only through direct negotiations between the parties without preconditions. Israel will continue to oppose the unilateral recognition of a Palestinian state. Such recognition in the wake of the October 7th massacre would give a huge reward to unprecedented terrorism and prevent any future peace settlement. The plan would include many steps rejected by Israel in the past, including evacuating many communities in the biblical lands of Judea and Samaria, also known as the West Bank, along with a Palestinian capital in eastern Jerusalem and a combined government for the West Bank and Gaza. Israeli government spokesman Avi Hyman said it's not time to speak about the day after the war ends. Now is not the time to be speaking about gifts for the Palestinian people at a time when the Palestinian Authority themselves have yet to even condemn the October 7th massacre. Now is the time for victory total victory against Hamas. All discussions of the day after Hamas will be had the day after Hamas. And today in southern Israel, a terrorist attack at a bus station, a shooter killing two and wounding four others before being stopped. Meanwhile, Israel criticized a United Nations official who told Sky News that despite its acts of terror, Hamas is not a terror organization, which is a position held by the UN. I think it's very difficult. And as you say, I've, I've worked with many, many, many different terrorists and, and, and insurgent groups. Uh, Hamas is not a terrorist group for, for us, of course, as you know, it's a political movement. Posting on X, Israel's UN ambassador Gilad Erdan blasted Griffiths, saying, you are no humanitarian. Sadly, you are a terror collaborator. Also, Netanyahu and other senior Israeli officials met with CIA Director William Burns in Tel Aviv to discuss talks for the release of the hostages. The prime minister earlier refused to send a delegation to Cairo for talks on Thursday until Hamas lessened its demands. Families of the hostages chained themselves together at the entrance to the defense ministry, calling for the war cabinet to send a delegation to Cairo. And in Gaza, IDF spokesman Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari explained Israel's military mission in the Nasser Hospital in Gaza, where Israeli intelligence believed bodies and hostages were being held. According to the information we have collected, I, I can now share some of the terrorists who took part in the massacre of October 7th. They were found by our forces inside the Nasser Hospital complex. If it weren't for Hamas starting this war, taking our hostages and hiding in the hospital, we wouldn't need to be in the hospital in the first place. Hamas started this war. Israel will end this war. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thank you so much, Julie. In other news, former President Trump is set to hear the verdict in his civil fraud trial today. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right. Thank you, Andrew. The former president likely to be hit with millions of dollars in penalties and other sanction, sanctions rather, when a judge decides the case. New York Attorney General Letitia James is seeking $370 million and a ban on Trump and other defendants from doing business in the state. The verdict coming after a judge ruled his first criminal trial is set to start on March 25th. Trump pleaded not guilty to nearly three dozen counts of falsifying business records that accuse him of attempting to hide from voters a relationship with Stormy Daniels and an effort to buy her silence. Trump wanted the case dismissed, arguing it's politically motivated. 
Russia because they want to get it desperately before the election. And in Atlanta, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis returning to the witness stand today in a special hearing of misconduct allegations leveled against Willis and Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade. Trump and several co-defendants accuse Willis of benefiting financially from the relationship. Willis admits a personal relationship with Wade, but denied any financial conflict of interest that would disqualify her from the case, fighting back in her testimony Thursday. You're confused. You think I'm on trial. It is unclear when the judge might rule. Well, a potential developing threat from Russia, the White House has confirmed that Moscow has obtained a troubling anti-satellite capability that could uh, include using nuclear devices in space. CBN's Jenna Browder is following the story here in Washington. Is Russia planning to put a nuclear weapon in space? That's unclear. The White House Thursday only calling it an anti-satellite capability. There is no immediate threat to anyone's safety. We are not talking about a weapon that can be used to attack human beings or cause physical destruction here on Earth. The administration working to calm fears and stressing that Russia's emerging new weapon isn't ready to go yet. This is not an active capability, but it is a potential one that we're taking very very seriously. The Kremlin is downplaying U.S. concern, saying it's a ruse to make Congress support aid for Ukraine. I think first we need a better understanding of what exactly the capability is. John Hardy with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies tells CBN's Faith Nation it's unclear if Russia is planning to put a nuclear weapon in space or just take down its satellites. Either way, he says Moscow's latest aggression speaks to its bigger goals. The Russians have long seen that, that space is really vital to U.S. military operations. And so they want to be able to take that away from us. It all came to light this week when House Intelligence Chair Mike Turner released an urgent message calling on President Biden to declassify information relating to a serious national security threat, leading to mixed reaction from Congress. I certainly would not have done it like that. But in any event, we are where we are at this point. He was absolutely right. Absolutely right. And every single one of you as American citizens, I'm thankful that you made the decision to be right. The Wall Street Journal editorial board arguing that Americans need to be aware of the potential threats. America is sleepwalking into a new age of military and homeland vulnerability, and political leaders need to tell the public the uncomfortable truth. Russia's ambitions to target critical satellites are a blatant violation of international treaties. Jenna Browder, CBN News. Turning now to an update on the mass shooting in Kansas City at the Chiefs Super Bowl celebration Wednesday that killed one person and wounded almost two dozen others. Authorities saying it apparently dis uh, stemmed from a dispute between several people. Police are looking for others who may have been involved and are calling for witnesses to come forward. A Missouri pastor who was at the rally with his wife and two kids is crediting a miracle from God for saving them, saying the Holy Spirit prompted them to leave before their favorite players were even introduced. At first, the pastor said he wasn't sure, but his wife also felt they should leave. She actually asked, she's like, should we go? And um, she's like, this, you know, I know this is important. Do you want to stay? And I'm like, you know what, we should go and just felt that sense to go. And so we started walking uh, back, and um, all of a sudden, in a, in a little bit, we're getting texts, are you okay? And um, I think it it really kind of hit me. I was, I went back and I'm like, what in the world is going on? I, I look at this aerial shot from the helicopter and it's, uh, it's, it's panning down and there's, there's blood on the street. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we were standing right there. Pastor Hensel also says he's feeling brokenhearted as his city is hurting after the shooting. And he says the experience shows him Christians need to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit. I guess I would encourage others um, to practice listening. We do a lot of talking. We do a lot of praying, which is good. But uh, listening is just as important because he has something to say. That is some good advice, and you can see the full interview on CBNNews.com. When Sarah Huckabee Sanders was elected the governor of Arkansas, she quickly made education reform a key focus, including school choice. 
Now, Arkansas is one of 14 states that lets students use state money to go to private schools. CBN contributing correspondent Paul Petit spoke with a family about the benefits of the new voucher program. The halls are bustling at Providence Academy in Rogers, Arkansas. The private classical Christian school is at capacity with 580 students. 71 of those students are enrolled through the state's new school voucher program. There were like a bunch of different schools to see like uh, which one would be the best fit. And then there was just like something like a sign from God, like something that like Providence just had. It had like a sign that like, whoa, this stands out above all the other places. Kira is thriving in the Christian environment, and her mom says she couldn't be happier after watching Kira struggle in public school. Public school was not a good fit for Kira. Um, socially, academically, she did fine. Socially, it was it was difficult. To hear Kira's story is just, it's touching. It's, um, it's special, again, to be a part of the kingdom of God and to be a part of a, a ministry that um, can invest in students in a way that impacts them potentially for the, the rest of their lives. School choice programs are growing nationwide. So far this year, lawmakers in 14 states have passed bills establishing school choice or expanding existing ones. 42 states introduced such bills according to EdChoice, a nonprofit that tracks school choice policies. In fact, the proliferation of new or expanded school choice programs has advocates calling 2023 the year of universal choice. Arkansas Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders titled her new education policy, which includes school vouchers, the LEARNS Act. Education in Arkansas is among the very worst in the country. Now, someone might argue, are we 45th or we 48th or whatever we are? Regardless, the reason is we are, uh, the fact is that we're in the bottom of education. Something drastic had to be done now. Here's how it works. Parents of students approved for school of choice are set up with what's called educational freedom accounts, which provides $6,600 in public funds per student. 94 private and parochial schools in Arkansas are taking part with nearly 5,000 students enrolled statewide. We were interested in participating uh, for the opportunity to expand on our mission, which is to partner with parents in a classical college preparatory education to equip students with a biblical worldview, all to God's glory. So it meant to us more families to serve and to partner with, uh, some of whom would not be able to participate in our programming if not for the LEARNS Act and the funding. But the LEARNS Act didn't pass without a fight, including protests and a failed attempted statewide referendum. Well, I think the state of Arkansas is charged by our constitution with educating kids. It doesn't say educate them with a public school education. It doesn't say education uh, with any particular way. And so we take that as what is the best way to educate all kids? And it's with choice and with option. Senator Hester says the final peg of pushing school choice through the Arkansas state legislature and implementing it with educators than finding someone who's done it before. Governor Sanders contacted the office of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and hired away their Secretary of Education, Jacob Oliva. Secretary Oliva was the key for passing this legislation and he is, will be the key for success in this legislation. Providence Academy and all private schools plan to give annual tests to voucher students to assess their learning. Kira's mom says what's harder to measure but evident is the way a Christian education has impacted her daughter's mental health. She's happy. She's, she comes out of school smiling. She has friends. She has a group of friends that she never had before. And um, they accept her for who she is and they love her for who she is. It makes me feel really good to know that, the, that some kids that were getting lost in the shuffle uh, now are gonna get to go shine somewhere else. Um, and again, I've said this a, a lot of times, but every kid's not gonna fit in the same box. Uh, it is imperative that we have more options uh, that parents get the lead on. Kira says she's glad she was led to Providence Academy. Their motto is like building leaders for Christ. So they're building leaders for the Lord. They give you great education and they're, they really prepare you for like life. In Rogers, Arkansas, Paul Petit, CBN News. Thank you, Paul. Those numbers are a pleasant surprise to many people. You know, 14 states passing the bills, 42 introducing such bills.
And like that representative said, some kids just they'll thrive in a Christian community. Of course, there are many public schools with a lot of strong Christian students, faculty and staff, but that may not be the place for a particular student for whatever reason. So this is good news for an awful lot of folks. Yeah. Healthy living is more than just a lifestyle, it's a destination. And in the brand new book, Dr. Colbert's Health Zone Essentials, you're getting the treasure map for your journey. Dr. Don Colbert is a prolific New York Times bestselling author. As an expert on nutrition and anti-aging medicine, he sold upwards of 10 million books and treated more than 50,000 patients. His newest book offers tips to optimize the gut, brain, and hormones, and explains the benefits of a Mediterranean diet. In Health Zone Essentials, Dr. Colbert combines the wisdom of four previous zone books to help us live healthier, longer lives. Well, Dr. Don Colbert is with us now, and we welcome you back to the 700 Club. It's great to have Thank you. Thank you. Here. It's great being here. Let's jump right in because I, I love this book because you've kind of <clears throat> consolidated areas that we all need to and want to address, right. Right. but you've made it easy for right. us. Sure. Let's begin with the gut. We hear so much about that, and right. I think even though we've talked about it a lot on the 700 Club, people wonder what's the big deal about the gut? Well, the gut is the foundation of health. That's where literally most disease begins in the gut. In fact, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, said over 2,000 years ago that all disease begins in the gut. And now we're just seeing that he was true, especially autoimmune disease. Most every autoimmune disease starts here in the gut. I just saw it the other day. This week, a lady with rheumatoid arthritis, she was on all these meds, methotrexate, and these bio she had been on biologic meds. Nothing helped. I started healing her gut. I put on natural things like boswellia, curcumin, as well as a natural, uh, I put on a little bit of naltrexone to reset her autoimmune. But the key is I, I healed the gut. I took away the foods that were damaging the gut. And now her arthritis markers are down to normal. Really? It's amazing. Wow. But wow. there's a brain gut connection. I was just going to mention that. So that is huge. Yeah. And so many people's brains are cloudy because their gut is a mess. And so we're going to move down to the gut in okay, a minute. Good. I mean the brain in a minute, but tell us what we have here. You've got um, well, these are like the training wheels, like on a bicycle. We need to give them some basic things to help them because 95% of Americans are low in fiber. They don't take in enough fiber, and fiber is essential. And the foods with fiber they're taking are wheat bran and all the grain products with the lectins so that now damage you've the got gut. With that. Yeah, right. So instead, right. let's use cruciferous veggies, the stems and the berries, high in fiber, as well as our fiber zone contains yeah. just a wonderful, soluble, insoluble fiber that is wonderful for the gut with prebiotics in it, as well as our probiotic, which is a powerful probiotic mm -hmm. that contains 16 billion colony forming wow. units of some of those powerful probiotics. See, the probiotics literally train our immune yeah. systems. They regulate inflammation. They repair the gut lining. They're critical. They're also in foods like fermented foods, such as, you know, kombucha, kimchi, um, yogurt. That's, um, is cabbage she, one of those if it's like a, like a Oh, yes, cabbage is wonderful. Uh, kimchi is good, mm -hmm. sauerkraut's good, but they have to be fermented. fermented. A lot of it, yes. a lot of it doesn't have the probiotics in yeah. it. Mm -hmm. It's just processed and it kills all the good bacteria. So we're standing in front of bananas that are green. <laughs> tell me about that, because <laughs> that's not bananas. what I look for when well, I go to the grocery store. You, I love bananas, but once they turn yellow, I give them to my grandkids, because <laughs> green bananas are good for the gut. They're yes. a resistant starch. See, the uh, small intestines and the stomach doesn't digest it. It reaches all the way to the large intestines. Mm. It feeds the good bacteria, and it also fuels the intestinal cells. And it's in green bananas, green mangoes, green papayas, as wow. well as also it's contained in uh, yams and sweet potatoes and yucca and taro root. These roots that are wonderful for the gut and olive oil. Oh my goodness! There's this is one of well, I call it one of the power tools for the gut. These high dose yeah. polyphenols, like high, there's a whole new class of olive oil the high polyphenol olive oil. Now, I gotta warn people, when you take this, it burns, you get a burn in your throat, oh, really? and you may cough. 
but that's a sign that's really it's good. It's doing its job. It's doing its job. <laughs> it also helps to clean your arteries. It cleans plaque out of the brain. It's amazing, but it's what is so good for the gut. It heals the gut. Well, cleaning out is something I want to talk to you about. We're talking about power tools here, yes. but this is... Oh, blueberries. One of my favorite yeah, power and tools. They're real. In your book, I was really surprised at how significant they are. Well, it's, again, high in these polyphenols, mm -hmm. and, and it's also high in fiber, and it's great for the brain, as well as this is our breakfast scramble. You say, breakfast scramble? Well, it has some of the most powerful foods, and it has those yams that heal the gut, diced up yams. It has the mushrooms, and it has the onions, and it has the spinach, and also the pasture-raised organic eggs. It has the avocado oil, just a little grass-fed butter, and then a little um, turkey sausage. Wow. And so it tastes delicious, and yet it's giving you all those good healthy fats, a lot of avocado oil that's cold-pressed. Yeah. That's really good for the brain, really good for the gut. And one of the things you say is that each of these things builds on the other, yes. each of these areas. We Talk have, about that. Uh, but we have to start with the foundation of health. It's the gut. And realize that most people in America, their guts are decimated. Why? From antibiotics, from anti-inflammatory meds, from acid-blocking yeah. meds, from wheat. Wheat contains 23,788 proteins, any one of which can inflame the gut. Wow. As well as lectins. Lectins are, are foods that literally, uh, plant-based foods that contain proteins that literally tear the gut apart, cause leaky gut, like beans, peas, lentils. We've got to repair the gut or we can't follow a Mediterranean diet. So talk about the Mediterranean diet. What uh, what does that look like? What does it include? What do we cut out? <laughs> well, I started writing years ago, my book about 30 years ago was What Would Jesus Eat? Yeah. It's the healthiest diet in the world yeah. and it contains living food. Mm -hmm. That is the key, living food. Here in America, we eat dead food, yeah. processed food. Processed food contains all these chemicals, all of these toxins that literally damage our gut and our brain and set us up for disease. Living foods that are organic mm -hmm. are the best foods for us. And the Mediterranean diet has just that. But what I've done, the Mediterranean diet back years ago contained wheat. Wheat is so damaging. Why? Because it's been crossbred and hybridized. It has all these inflammatory proteins that damage our gut. So we need to either cut the wheat out for a season until our gut heals, or we need to uh, at least switch to a grain that won't inflame the gut. Like So it's not forever. Not forever, yeah. right. And yeah. we can still introduce some wheat like, or in the form of sourdough bread because mm -hmm. the, the yeast has taken out most of the gluten. So yes. it's okay to have that once yes, your gut heals. So that's yeah. the good news about it. So talk about what you have here because people, <laughs> I think we're all confused. I mean, I, I look online at things and everybody's selling something right. and it's right. all the answer to a million things right. and it's Confusing. Well, something happens to most every man at around, and woman at around 50. Mm -hmm. The men's testosterone drops. drops. The women's estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone are gone. Yeah. And so the, when men and women come to me, I check all their hormones. 99% mm -hmm. uh, of the time, men's estrogen levels are much, much higher than the women. Wow. And the women, sometimes their testosterone is higher than the husband. Wow. So the roles reverse. And so what I've done is I've, I've developed some training wheels, again, that help thyroid hormones. So many people come to my office, cold hands, cold feet, weight gain, yeah. hair gets brittle, starts to fall out, dry skin. That's low thyroid symptoms, but mm. not necessarily low sluggish. I support the thyroid with these natural nutrients, thyroid zone. I developed this because a lot of people, the doctors won't prescribe thyroid hormones. Yeah. So this contains the iodine, the selenium, the natural nutrients, support the thyroid as well as testosterone. So many men's testosterone bottoms out around at 50s and their mm -hmm. 50s, 60s, it's even worse. This supports healthy testosterone levels and the hormone zone. This yeah. contains the DIM and the other nutrients that help to balance that estradiol mm -hmm. level. Men so many times have high estrogen, women have low. Yes. It helps to balance it. Yeah. <laughs> to talk to God about that one. <laughs> Tell me what this is really quickly. Okay. Brain, uh, the brain. We want to the, the brain. And this is my brain smoothie. And it contains uh, triple washed organic kale. And people say, I hate kale. I used oh, to I hate love kale. kale. Well, yeah. I, well, so many of my patients hate it. But I said, just try my brain zone smoothie. It contains frozen blueberries, a half a cup mm -hmm. of frozen blueberries that are organic, along with half a cup of triple washed organic 
organic kale along with ice and stevia. It makes a delicious drink that's brain boosting. Mm -hmm. And you can substitute frozen strawberries now, if you want. That's easy to do in the morning. Sure, <laughs> it is. And you can put a little avocado oil if you want it you know, for the healthy fats, which sure. is good. But not olive oil. Olive oil doesn't taste good. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want you to know we have just skimmed the tip of the iceberg, but it's all right in here. And I love that it's really five books in one. You it can is. get more great tips, pages and pages of recipes. It's all inside the brand new book called Dr. Colbert's Health Zone Essentials. It is available in stores nationwide. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Greece has become the first Orthodox Christian country to legalize same-sex civil marriage. 176 of the country's 300 lawmakers voted in favor of the law. The move comes over the objections of the Greek Orthodox Church, which cited concerns over the impact on traditional family values. A slim majority of Greek citizens approve of the measure. There are about 200 million Eastern Orthodox Christians in Eastern Europe and parts of Asia with smaller populations in other parts of the world. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing was one of the first on the ground in Cottonwood, Alabama, to provide disaster relief after intense tornadoes struck in January. When Reverend Lottie Williams heard the sirens go off, she was still in bed. She looked out the window and saw that her shed was down and a tree had fallen on her truck. She said all she could do was turn to Jesus. Well, thanks to support from its partners, Operation Blessing provided Lottie and several others, uh, several other families rather, with the water bottles, emergency food kits, and cleaning materials they needed after the storms. The disaster relief team helped Lottie clean away debris and damage from her home, and they found her Bible in the shed. She said she knew everything would be okay because Jesus will see her through. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Well, here is the story of an amazing man. Henry Allen risked his life just walking down the street. That's how it went for young black men in the South during the Jim Crow era. Henry was surrounded by racism. Some of these gentlemen with badges, some on horseback. Still, Henry was determined to win the fight for civil rights. That's why he defied hatred and marched toward the Capitol. When I found those state troopers, I never faced that much meaning hatred before. Then I began to see the real true hatred that would come out of a man. They were like, they wouldn't take my life. Born and raised in Selma, Alabama, Henry Allen grew up in a neighborhood where diversity was not only normal, it was welcomed. I'm living in a, a, a white neighborhood and we're all poor. <laughs> And we sharing a lot of things together, and that will never fight. There will never no hatred going on within us. We never saw any color because we didn't enjoy each other. But skirting the edges of his neighborhood was a century of legal racism. Alabama state and local officials prescribed to the laws of Jim Crow, which enforced racial segregation and voter restrictions. Henry never questioned it until his junior year of high school when he met Bernard Lafayette, the leader of a student nonviolent coordinating committee. And he started demonstrating and telling us the 14th and 15th Amendment, citizenship and right to vote. Everything that they done was to deny you opportunity to vote to become a first class citizen. I was more or less at a, at a stage of amazement about what is going on, eyes being opened up. Growing up in Jim Crowism, you didn't know a lot, you weren't told a lot about it. Nobody really want to talk about it. Henry soon became a foot soldier with the civil rights movement, standing Some up to Christian Selma's leadership. own sheriff, Jim Clark, and his rally of white supremacists. He's in my, as being the law said, that you're never going to vote, I'm going to make sure you're not going to vote. Your Klux claim was your, this was your white city council. They were your druggers, they were your, they were your car dealers, they were your business people. This was a form of intimidation. This is what this was all about to put fear in the ear. They would take your home, your property. They would even burn it down. It could even cost your life. It was a risk that became a reality for Henry. One afternoon, while walking to Brown Chapel Church for a protest, he encountered three state troopers on horseback. Instantly, they pursued him. With the grace of God, I was out running three horses down that sidewalk. Henry escaped into a stranger's home. I said, oh my God. I came so close to being killed today. I said, this is no fun. This is real. I had to make a decision. 
well, I was going to continue to quit. And it's in my spirit and heart, I said, no, you continue. On March 7, 1965, 600 peaceful protesters attempted a march from Selma to Montgomery. Under the directives of Governor George Wallace, Alabama state troopers blocked their march on the far side of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. When the men and women refused to disband, Sheriff Clark gave the order to attack. Dozens were wounded and one was killed in what the world came to know as Bloody Sunday. They wanted violence. Dr. Queen said, no, we're going to stick to non-violence. And then now we are, we are going to Montgomery and we're going to tell Governor Wallace that how we feel about it's what he's done to the black people. We are killing segregation. Two weeks later, Martin Luther King led Henry and 25,000 other protesters from the bridge in Selma to the Capitol in Montgomery. The following August, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act into law. If any county anywhere in this nation does not want federal intervention, it need only open its polling places to all of its people. A slight pride because we had, we had had a victory over Jim Claw. And so that was our, that was our bigger, bigger victory, that we had defeated Jim Crow. In 1972, Henry again defied segregation, becoming Selma's first African-American firefighter. I wasn't just, just a firefighter. This was a planned thing by God that I had to come back to Selma and be the first black firefighter. Henry later became the first African-American chief, this time with a unanimous vote by the Selma City Council. I said, God, you put me in a position here that I'm really going to need your help. It was a tremendous struggle because the man who I was replacing was a racist. And he had polarized the whole the, the department with racism. And the Spirit of God said, well, you need to go and talk to him. We call him administrator. As administrator, you have this whole organization full of racism. You've got certain equipment that whites work off of. You got certain equipment that blacks works off of. We want we want something better than this right here. He said, I hadn't thought that way. Now that you brought it to my attention, I'm gonna try my best to fix what's broken. And he did. I wanted what's right for everybody. They saw me as a leader. Not just a fire chief, they saw me as a leader. Now a retiree, Henry continues to fight against division. As the PTO president of his alma mater, he serves the youth of Selma reminding them how far we've come and how much further we need to go. I'm seeing a lot of reverse discrimination that I don't like. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of bitterness. I'm still, we've got a lot of people that are still toting this anger. And I, I'm troubled about this kind of spirit because it's not good for a mirror. As far as he sees it, there is only one bridge that can bring this country together. This bridge right here represents freedom. But the most important bridge of all that it, it's a crossover it from sin into a perfect relationship with, with Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I want to come to the race of the name of one people. Jesus Christ died for sins of the whole entire world. There's no discrepancy, no individuality. So in order to, to love Jesus Christ, you got to be love your brother and your sisters. Is that we have to show love for all mankind. Henry, we honor you for your perseverance and courage and Christ-led leadership and sensitivity to the Holy Spirit of God during the toughest of challenges. And what a reminder to us who call ourselves Christ followers, believers, Christians. He has the credibility to remind us that in order to love Jesus, we must love our brothers and sisters. Terry, what a, an important American. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm really enjoying this Black History Month going online and seeing posts of people that I've never heard of before. Well, I, I didn't really know anything about Henry Allen before, but who made such an incredible difference in the midst of that fight for freedom. And it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty special. I just finished watching the movie Harriet that came out a few years ago, and I never realized she was such a praying woman. I mean, I should yeah. have, but uh, just incredible. Yeah, faith faith, and, faith yeah. in the African-American community, very, very strong. Yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. Grandma Dow makes just a few dollars a day. 
not nearly enough to put food on the table. At one point, she got so desperate that she borrowed money from a loan shark. Grandma Dow has been helping to raise her grandson, but there's rarely enough for their daily needs. I love my grandson very much. One day, when they ran out of food, Grandma was forced to sell the tools she used to work on construction sites. She used the money to buy food. That was very hard for me. My tools are important. We shared small fish and some rice for a few days. Her grandson, Mix, tries to be brave. When we don't have anything to eat, my stomach hurts, but I don't tell her. Grandma was finally forced to borrow money from a loan shark to start a business selling chicken. She was only able to make a few dollars a day, and soon her debt mushroomed to nearly $600. I could only afford to pay interest on the loan. I wondered how I would ever get out of debt. I felt so hopeless. Then Orphan's Promise gave Grandma some food. We also trained her how to manage a business, including saving and paying down debt. We then helped her to expand the business by providing extra supplies and ingredients so she could add new items to the menu. Finally, we gave her a new large umbrella for her food cart. Grandma's earnings have increased to more than $15 a day, and she's now paid off her debts. I feel like I can breathe now. Our lives have turned around completely. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Because of your generosity and your caring about other people, we're able to go out in the field, find p people who are trapped in the cycle of poverty. You know, without this grandmother being encouraged, without someone coming along and not just giving her more money, but actually showing her how to pay off that debt and giving her what she needed to be able to do that, how to run a business of her own, her grandson would have wound up in an orphanage. That's one of the things we're doing, keeping families together. And we say thank you for that. It's a God idea. It's the way we're supposed to grow up and it's the way we're supposed to run our health household. Sometimes people just need a little bit of a helping hand to move forward. That's one of the things you support when you become a 700 Club member and there's so many more. Helping the home front with our military people, giving drinking water, clean drinking water to people around the world, emergency surgery, disaster relief. It's all part of being a 700 Club member. If you haven't joined yet, will you do it today? 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. There's the toll free number. See it on your screen. It's 1 800 700 7000. Just call, tell us you want to join, and then tell us what level. Let me show you the levels you have open to you. That top line is a general membership, but you could become a 700 Club Gold member for $40 a month or join the 1000 Club, $84 a month. You can see there's a 2500 level, a founders level. Do it now because you really can make a difference. And listen, here's great news. When you do, we have a gift for you. We're going to send you How to Believe for Healing. This is a teaching by Gordon Robertson. It's accompanied by a handbook that helps you work through the principles that are taught in this. We want it to be yours. So call now and know immediately that you are making a huge difference in lives all around the world, really. Andrew? Johnny Chang, he spent years locked up in a detention center and witnessed countless beatings and assaults was even in a few dozen fights himself. Still, he wasn't scared straight. He didn't change his life because of prison. He changed his life because of a black bean noodle lunch. He would be me every day, um, multiple times a day. I remember like just fearing for my life. Like I would freeze up and um, next thing you know, I'm seeing stars. From the age of five, Johnny Chang suffered physical abuse from his father. The beatings became a source of anger and led to fighting with his peers. I was just very, like, filled with rage. I would just see red, and then I would come to, like, oh, snap, you know, I either have, like, something in my hand or, like, persons on the floor or, like, we're just, like, bloody, everyone's bloody. Like, it's just, it was really bad. Johnny grew up in East L.A. in the housing projects. By age 12, he joined a gang seen the gang members, even the Asian gang members with money, they had cars, clothes, notoriety. There was just some kind of like pull. And on top of that, I noticed they were very tight knit. They were very family oriented. Feeling at home with his new gang family, Johnny began committing violent crimes. At 12 years old, Johnny was sent to a juvenile detention center for the worst of the worst. 
Over his four years there, he witnessed sexual assault, was in more than 40 fights, and became even more hardened. When I saw that, I was like, you know what? Even if I die, like, I'm not gonna let these people step on me. At 16, he was released. As a 17-year-old, Johnny was tried as an adult and sent to federal prison for assault with a deadly weapon. He knew being locked up in the penitentiary was another level. I was scared. You're now in there with people who are like, you know, adults and they're crazy, you know, they'll kill you. He served eight and a half years of his 10 year sentence and wondered what real life looked like on the outside. I just felt this uncertainty. I had seen people who had completely been rehabilitated in prison and they say, I'm never gonna come back here, but six months later, they're back. Like it's, it's, not, it's not hard to come back. You know, it's very hard to stay out. So it's like I, I was just existing at that time and I felt a lot of um, like emptiness inside of my heart. Johnny tried living a normal life. I applied to like a lot of places and nobody called me back. So at that point, I really felt like a rage again and anger. And I'm like, okay, if you're not gonna give me a chance, then I'm gonna just go and live the way that I know. Back on the streets, he was making thirty to $40,000 a month selling drugs. For Johnny, it wasn't enough. Still felt that emptiness, still felt that void, which was like blew my mind, you know. I thought if I made some money, I'll be okay, you know. During a robbery attempt of a rival drug dealer, Johnny's fellow gang member was shot. A few days later, another friend was killed. So it was just like death all around me, and I really started to think for like, like, I never really thought about death because I was so caught up in the moment. His mother, who became a Christian while he was incarcerated, asked Johnny for a ride to church. The pastor's like, hey, Johnny, um, heard a lot about you. You know, glad that you're home. Um, your mom has kind of talked about you a little bit. But, um, you know, would you like to have some black bean noodles? And that's actually my favorite. You know, it's like my favorite um, dish. So I just parked the car, went inside, ate the black bean noodles. It was really, really delicious. And um, he starts to kind of ask me some, some questions. The pastor shared the good news of Jesus with Johnny and spoke very directly about his need for a savior. And he talked about emptiness, void, you know, this feeling that I felt. It was as if he was like dissecting my heart and giving me the antidote. It's almost like a light bulb clicked and it turned on. Johnny gave his life to Christ and noticed a complete change in his life and in his heart. A friend told Johnny the change is clear. He told me, he's like, you know, it's it's obvious that you're you're so peaceful. Like you're not what you used to be. You know, he's like, I could see that like emanating out of you. He has since reconciled with his father who has also become a Christian. Today, he's podcasting and ministering in prisons. I, I think God has really led my life to put me in a position of being like, in the bottom of the bottom, at the lowest of the lows, going to prison and just drug everything, gangbang and everything. And I feel like God did that so I could understand people's hearts, like different levels. You know, not everyone's been to prison, um, but we're all interconnected by sin and struggle. There is hope, but it's not in this world. It's not in money. It's not in fame. It's, it's actually in God alone. And that's just what I'm here to do, is to shed light on that. Aren't you thankful for Johnny's story and his willingness to share it, to share what God has done to change a life? What a profound statement he made. We haven't all spent time in prison, but we're all connected by weariness, suffering, and sin. Jesus said that. He said, all of you who are weary, come to me, and I will give you rest. That's an invitation. That's an invitation to you. And Paul said in Romans... All of us have fallen short. I have, you have. All of us fall short because we sin. We fall short of the glory of God. But the good news, Paul goes on to say, is that how did God demonstrate his love to us? He did so while we were still in our sin. Jesus died for us. This is great news. It means you and I don't have to make ourselves perfect. We don't have to clean ourselves up first before we present ourselves to Jesus. 
We're not trying to earn it. We can't earn it. We go to him as we are. Johnny went to Jesus as he was and said, here I am. You know what you've got in me. And I'm beginning to understand what I have in you. You think of Johnny's life and what he endured and the peace he now presents. You can see the countenance of the love of Christ in his eyes. That peace that surpasses understanding he has experienced. He's living out John 14, 27, where Jesus said, peace I give to you. My peace, Jesus called it. I give to you. I leave with you. He said that to his disciples, to his friends, and he says it to us today. And he said, the peace I give is not like the world gives. That's why Johnny said, we can't hope in the world. Jesus' peace that he gives, it's a gift we have to receive and open, isn't like the world gives. And that is great news. And Jesus went on to say, not only do we have this peace, but do not be troubled and do not be afraid. The invitation is there for you today. If you want what Johnny has, pray with me now. Just surrender to the Lord. Lord Jesus, I see the life change in Johnny. And he was an ordinary man who struggled and had a lot in his past to overcome. And as tough as he was, he just simply laid his sin before you at the cross and said, Jesus, I surrender to you. I repent of my sin, of what I've done against the holy God. Yet you also know what's been done to me and what I've had to endure. And I give it all to you. And I repent of my sin and I embrace your cross. And I want to live for you every day of my life. Jesus, I give you my heart. I repent and I ask you to lead me in Jesus' name. And I want to pray for you if you just prayed. Father God, for those who prayed with me now, let them experience the joy and peace that surpasses understanding. It's a new day. They are new creations, says the Word of God. Let them embrace that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Give us a call at 1-800-700-7000. We're going to send you something. It's called A New Day, and it's a great resource for you on this journey. We're so happy for you and the decision you have made. We love you. Thanks for being with us today. Bye-bye.